Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Glad you made it through the rain and the flooded streets and highways and crazy drivers to be here tonight with us. Um, so you say welcome. My name is Annette Williams, and I am the chairperson of the Women's Spirituality Program here at CIIS. This year, the Women's Spirituality Program is celebrating its 25th anniversary. That's a major milestone, and we're really happy and excited. So, applause. Yay! As part of this celebration, the Women's Spirituality Program has been pleased to present its spring 2018 speaker series, Women, Visionaries, and Activists. Tonight's offering that dovetails with CIIS's 50th anniversary Golden Jubilee celebration brings you visionary best-selling author Mary Mackey in conversation with Women's Spirituality Program co-founder Mara Keller on the subject, bringing goddess-worshipping cultures of prehistoric Europe to life. A few thank yous are in order before we continue. A thank you to Denise Boston, Dean of Diversity and Inclusion, and the CIAS Office of Diversity and Inclusion for collaborating with Women's Spirituality to host our speaker series. A great debt of gratitude is owed to the program's founders, Eleanor Gaydon and Mara Lynn Keller, and particularly to Dr. Keller, who continues to share her knowledge and heart with the program as a former chairperson and current core faculty member. I would like to acknowledge Alka Aurora, WSC former chairperson and core faculty, and Valerie Joy Fidmont, our program coordinator. Special thank you to Lisa Christie, the program's administrative adjunct and faculty member, who is the bedrock of the special events plan for this semester this year. Speaking of special events planned for this year, we're very excited to announce that in October, the Women's Spirituality Program will hold a conference, Women Rising, New Visions for a Post-Patriarchal World. Tonight's event is a benefit for the Women Rising Conference, and Mary Mackey has generously and graciously donated her time to be with us in support of the conference. So thank you, Mary. Now, I would like to introduce the Women's Spirituality Program by speaking to an oft-heard question. What is Women's Spirituality? I know many people are hard-pressed to define what Women's Spirituality is. I know tonight I might be preaching to the choir, but I'm working on a short-form spiel to introduce the movement, area of academic study, and ontological orientation or worldview that is Women's Spirituality. So Women's Spirituality grew in part out of questioning the psychological underpinnings and self-justification of patriarchy, which is a theology that posits God as unquestionably male, as unquestionably white male. From this, dominant Western sociocultural narratives were constructed. Subjugation of women and those deemed other received license. Challenges to that foundational proposition of the male God allowed women to access our own divinity, power, and voices. In the Women's Spirituality Program, it is the multiple and diverse voices and perspectives of women, non-gender conforming individuals, and subjugated others that we privilege. Her stories and their stories are valid history, as valid as his story. So, the evening's format the evening will be a flow of readings and conversation focused first on Mary's novels about goddess-worshipping matricultures, followed by a period of questions from the audience. And then the focus will turn to Mary's poetry, again followed by a, a Q&A session. And the microphone, microphone will be brought to individuals wishing to ask questions. Excuse me? Yes, and please turn off your telephones. So please remember to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Give you a minute. I'd like to introduce Dr. Keller. Dr. Marlene Keller is a professor of philosophy, religion, and women's spirituality at the California Institute of Integral Studies where she served as director of the Women's Spirituality Graduate Program for 10 years. 
Her research and writing center on the ancient goddess cultures of Crete and Greece and on women's visionary culture with a focus on women's visionary poetry, fiction, and film. Her plenary speech for the Parliament of World Religions in 2015 voiced the theme, the freedom of religion to worship goddess is a social justice issue. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Marilyn Keller. Well, welcome again to everybody who's come out in these April showers that <laughs> have visited us this, uh, today. You know, Mary and I have been friends and colleagues for quite a while now, and um, so she is a brilliant writer, a superb storyteller, and um, an amazing poet, and I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> and she's one of the funniest people I've ever met. So this all makes for good visiting and good conversations. And tonight we get to be in conversation about her novels, her fiction, and her poetry. So thank you very much for coming. And thank you for inviting me. For supporting our benefit and fundraising for our conference for the fall. Uh, I'm going to uh, read some of Mary's um, bio. She uh, is a professor emeritus of English and a writer in residence at California State University in Sacramento, where she helped found both the CSUS Women's Studies Program and the CSUS English Department Graduate Creative Writing Program. And she's also occasionally an adjunct professor of women's spirituality here at CIIS where we have, um, she teaches, we sometimes teach courses on women's visionary film, women's visionary poetry, women's visionary fiction. So that has been a good collaboration. She is the New York Times bestselling author of 14 novels, five of which tell the stories of the priestesses and goddess worshiping cultures of old Europe and prehistoric Sumer. And we'll look at all of those in the first half of this evening. She has also read, um, and those books are based on the research of the late archaeologist, Dr. Maria Gimbutas, uh, who helped her with The Year the Horses Came and Horses of the Gate. Her novel about ancient Sumer, The Last Warrior Queen, is based on a non-patriarchal interpretation of the Sumerian legend of the goddess Inanna's descent into the underworld and takes readers into the Fertile Crescent goddess worshiping cultures described by the late Merlin Stone in When God Was a Woman. Mary is also the author of uh, seven collections of poetry that are visionary and mystical, including Sugar Zone, which won the Penn Oakland Joseph, Josephine Miles Award for Excellence in Literature. Her newest collection of poetry the Jaguars That Prowl Our Dreams, New and Selected Poems, 1974 to 2018, will be published by Marsh Hawks, Hawk Press this fall. She's frequently a guest speaker in our women's spirituality classes, as I said with me, and a co-teacher. In 2004, we awarded her a foremother of the women's spirituality movement from the CIS Women's Spirituality Program. And this award, which Mary treasures, was a statue of an ancient bird goddess. Now you are invited to visit her website at marymackey.com, where you'll find images of ancient um, goddess relics from the old matricultures of old Europe. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> I don't even usually need a microphone, but I want to make sure everybody can. All right, good. Well, your first goddess book was The Last Warrior Queen. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, 1983. What inspired you to write your first goddess book? Well, um, I had been, I read Marilyn Stone's uh, When God Was a Woman, and I started thinking very seriously about. Um, female deities and goddesses and women. This is a long, of course, a long time ago. And then I was in a writing group with Charlene Spreton, and she was doing Lost Goddesses of Early Greece. And she was just beginning to do it in that group. And I, I was very interested in her reinterpretation uh, of the patriarchal myths of the goddesses and how she was looking at the older myths that came 
and the older stories that came from uh, after them. So I, um, one day I was, you know, sitting in the library grading freshman compositions, actually, and I, I pulled a book down off the shelf called History Begins at Sumer, my uh, writer named Samuel Noah Kramer, and it was about the Sumerians, and I thought, aha, and I knew, I looked at the goddess Inanna, I looked at that, and I thought, you know, this book I want to read doesn't exist, so I'm going to write it. <laughs> I'm going to write a book about the cultures, the pre-Sumerian cultures, the cultures, the goddess cultures of the Fertile Crescent before the um, invasions that put the Sumerians in place, because the Sumerians were basically patriarchal, although they had goddesses. And I thought that the myth of Inanna and her descent into the underworld was an interesting myth to look at as a backbone for it. So I had to do a, this, this was before the internet. There actually was a time before that. So I had to do a, lot, a great deal of research for it. But I became more and more enchanted with uh, the story that has now been working in my mind for well, almost 40 years, which is this story of goddess cultures. What were they like before patriarchy came in? How did they change? How did that change them? And I started living in those cultures um, in Sumeria. And then um, the rest, you can probably guess as this developed in my mind it developed into about really is my life's work which are these recreations making the goddess cultures of old Europe particularly but also of the Fertile Crescent come along. Now I understand this book was rather successful it which, was, yeah. which is wonderful and uh, you know it's not always that easy for women to be successful as authors even today so I know you like to encourage a lot of women writers to just keep going. And uh, even if you get 30 rejections, it's okay. You just keep oh, going. 30? I got joined at 50. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think because of the success you told your publisher that right. you had a, a, you wanted to do a whole series. Right. What I was going to do, because I really liked uh, writing The Last Warrior Queen, um, was that I, I had an outline for eight other novels mm -hmm. on this on this subject. I was going to have the main characters in this book reincarnated in different incarnations, going all the way through time up to the present, going you know through the witch, witch burnings and all of that, and I was going to look at the, uh, the survival of the, of the matriculture and you know, how it had gone through time. And so I brought this to, you know, my agent took it, my editor it was an outline for eight more novels. And they said, oh, they said, well, you know, the problem is that women have peaked. So <laughs> we don't want any more stuff by women because they've peaked and they're not going to be any more interested in women writers and women stuff. So that was kind of a blow, but I put that outline away and I decided, all right, I will write stuff that is, you know, um, about women and about women's friendship. And so I, I had to write, well, not had to, I enjoyed doing it, but I wrote several other novels, some of which were quite successful before I was actually able to come back to the things I wanted to write about, which were these cultures. And then you started your Earth Song series, I did. which has uh, began in 1993. So you've been living with the uh, mother culture in your mind and spirit all that time. All that time. And, and the story of how I started writing the Earth Song series is that um, I, was, I had written several other successful novels. And one day I got a phone call from the head of Harper San, not the head of, the, yeah, it was the head of Harper San Francisco, John Loudon. And he said, um, I know you've written cult uh, books about, um, you know, mother cultures. Uh, I think he said matriarchies in the, in the past. And um, I have a manuscript here I'd like you to look at. We'd like you to consider writing a novel about it. Well, to be invited to write a novel about something is always a pleasure to an author. So I said, of course, send me the manuscript. I'd be interested. He sent me the manuscript. It turned out to be Maria Gimbutas' Civilization of the Goddess. Oh okay. So I, I still have that manuscript. It was before it was published. And so I looked, I started reading, and I said, oh, this is exactly what I've been looking for because it would take almost my whole life to do this research because it was her life's work. And, you know, I'm a historical, I'm a historical fiction writer. And so now she's done all those really literal spade work. She's done all of these things, and so I can take this and I can do what I call, um, you know, uh, emotional archaeology. I can try to get into the minds of what it was like to live in these cultures, to be there. And I called him back and I said yes, and I gave him a three novel proposal, and they accepted it. And so I was finally able. So I had been longing for this chance, and it just came. It, the telephone rang, and I answered it. So that was that was what happened. And you went and consulted with Maria? I did. I was a little nervous because I was going to go to this woman whom I admired greatly as a researcher. Uh, and so I went down to LA and I went out to her place in the desert and 
um, she greeted me with an apple pie, <laughs> so oh, that put me at my ease. And I, I was going to have to say to her, uh, I'm going to turn your life's research into fiction. I hope you don't have any objections to that. She was wonderful about it. She said, yes, this is, this is, this is wonderful. Um, I said, well, you know, I talked about various things. With her. I said, what do you imagine, you know, they thought about, you know, reproduction and things like this. And she said, I'm a scholar. My job is to do the, the scholarly work. Your job is to imagine because you're an artist. And she just treated me so well. And she was very helpful. She answered my questions. And for the first two books in the series, The Year the Horses Came and The Horses at the Gate, um, she really liked them. And she even wrote me notes saying, this is the best I could have imagined of um, a projection of my work into a, into a novel, into fiction, into reality. You really made it come alive. And that was one of the most wonderful moments of my life when I got this uh, letter from her. So. And I just learned that you wrote um, a vision of her and you put it into your uh, novel. I did. I did. And um, I will read it. There's a part in the novel. Let's see here. I'm going to find this. Um, this is the year the horses came. This is, well, that's not the one it's in. That's just that. That's just for your information. Okay. So horses, <laughs> horses at the gate, and uh, <laughs> I did that on purpose. Um, <laughs> um, so Mora is the main character in the horse. The, the the three novels of the trilogy that are coming uh, up soon. We'll talk about. And she has been sent to a sacred city named Kataka which is now in Moldova. There are actually ruins of a city like this, which is built in a huge spiral. It's very, I think, quite mm -hmm. fascinating. And she's been being initiated into the uh, secrets of the dark goddess. I ought to say, as a side note, that in the mother cultures, um, dark was the positive color of earth and light, and it was the color of richness and fertility, and white was the color of bones and death. And when the patriarchal nomads came in and reintroduced the horses into Europe, they changed that because they were sun worshippers. They turned it around. They turned it upside down. So the secrets of the dark goddess are the deepest secrets of, of, of fertility and unity with the sacred earth. She's being. And so she has a teacher. And the teacher is, has asked her to make a snare out of her own hair. And she can't figure out why she's had to do this. And at one point, um, the teacher also asked her to make a perfect pot. And she, she can't, you know, she can't do it. She tries over and over again. And finally, the teacher finds a pot, and, and she brings it to her. And she says, "This one's perfect." She says, "Now hang your snare on a bush." And she hangs her snare on the bush. And the teacher, who's called the Imsha, who by the way has no, uh, no gender uh, uh, registered. She's a person between worlds, and and is, um, um, uh, and I and I make her this way. It. I mean, she calls herself it actually because. In order to do this, you have to be in all worlds at the same time. And so she has no specific gender. And there's a, a great honoring, by the way, in ancient cultures of people who have this, this talent to be in all worlds. So Mara uh, nods, and the Imsha grabs her by the wrist. And um, the snare is hanging on a bush. It's a little snare. And this is what happens. As soon as the Imsha's hand touched Mara's arm, she fell into a deep trance. For a moment, everything was a confused jumble of color and light. Then suddenly, the two of them began to shrink. Down and down they went, growing smaller and smaller, until the boulders around the pond looked like mountains, and the grass looked like trees. A butterfly flew over them, as huge as a ship, blue and yellow wings glowing like fire. And a chorus of frogs roared in her ears like the rushing of a great river. In front of them, the elderberry leaves became the size of sails, and the st st snare grew as large as a house. The Imsha led Mara toward the great net woven of black ropes, each as thick as her arm, and as they approached, the snare suddenly stiffened and stopped building. Time has stopped, the Imsha said, but Mara hardly heard. She was staring at a swallow that had frozen in the air above her, and she felt a rapture that was beyond terror. Mara looked and saw that every opening in the snare had become a window. I can't bear these visions, she said. Take them away. But the Imsha laughed and tightened her grip on Mara's wrist. Mara opened her eyes again. And in front of her, she looked, found herself looking into some kind of huge house, bigger than any mother house ever built. The blue-green light was coming from large glowing lanterns. 
and people dressed in shining robes were walking slowly, looking at things in, straight, in strange boxes, which were clear like water. Come this way, the Imsha whispered, and Mara seemed to float through the window into the house. And there it was only one person now, a middle-aged woman with gray-brown hair and boots with strange heels that looked like sticks. She was hit, leaning forward, examining something in one of the boxes. And when Mara looked closer, she saw it was the black and red bowl she had made only yesterday. Now you know why the bowl had to be perfect, the Imsha said. It came up behind the woman and put its hand on her shoulder. But the woman seemed not to know the Imsha was there. She just went on looking at Mara's bowl, frowning slightly, like someone lost in thought. The bowl is speaking to her, the Imsha said. She is hearing your voice over a gulf of years too great to count. She does not know she is hearing it, but she is. In your time, the goddess Earth has been forgotten, but your bowl is making her remember. You will make a great many bowls in your lifetime, but only this one will survive. Well, that's, a, that's a vision of Maria Gimbutas uh, looking at the bowls. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I, when, you, I had, when you said she took her her wrist, Mara's wrist, mm -hmm. and she fell into a trance. That reminded me that that's how you work yourself when yes, you write. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, for many years, I've developed, I've developed a personal technique for getting ideas, uh, which is a light trance, which I, I can go into. Uh, I do this for poetry. I do it for writing. And basically, I in, in novels, I project the story in my mind and run it like a movie when I'm there. But the secret is learning how to write this stuff down and not forget it. What you're doing is you're standing in a liminal state on the threshold between consciousness and sleep, between unconsciousness and consciousness, and you are finding a way to move into the deep, wordless unconscious of your mind and bring back ideas and transform them into words. And um, I, I used many different techniques and things of my own to develop this. And um, the secret, as I said before, is to remember. Because like when you have a dream and you wake and it's gone, if you go into this kind of state, which is completely self-controlled, um, you may forget it. And so I have learned over the years I can write um, with my eyes closed. It's, my handwriting's not very good, but I can write. One of the, by the way, one of the advantages of longhand you can actually write instead of printing. You can write and keep the letters connected. I used to try to type in that state, but I found that I would sometimes type, you know, this is with typewriters, I'd type everything on one line, or my fingers would move over, and it would like be rough or different when I move it. So the other thing you can do, I, I do, is I, I can come up and just stay right on the edge of it, and I can write, write everything down, or I can uh, speak into a, a recorder and do it. And I do this whenever I'm stuck a lot, I can, but I've gotten so good at it, I can do it like this now. It used to take me a while to actually get in that state, but over the years I've learned to do it. And I get a lot of ideas this way. I never lack for ideas. And so it's been it's been very fruitful for me. There's nothing I teach, it's nothing I, you know, hawk around or try to sell. It's just something I do for my work. So how did you envision the motherlands when you began? How did I envision the motherlands? Yes. Um, when I wrote this series, well I looked at Maria's work and it's the thing that really is interesting about this is that there were all these small, I used to think before I read her uh, research, that a Neolithic Europe, Europe in this period, which is about 4700 um, uh, BCE, uh, before the Common Era, um, was mostly people like living hunter-gathering things. But it turns out that's not true. There was trade, there was weaving, there were temples, there were even ceramic temples along the upper Danube that were shaped like bird goddesses. Um, there were some cities, not many, but there were some cities that were even fairly large. Um, so there was a culture going on. And these places were small, they were fairly peaceful. And what happened was at about this era that nomadic invaders reintroduced the horse to Europe from the Eurasian steppes. And the horse was like having a weapon or a tom tom or something because, you know, if you, if you live in small communities, and you go over and loot your neighbor's town, they'll come back and loot your town. You know, you, you, can't, you can't live that way. But the nomads introduced a genocidal warfare, into, and they were patriarchal nomads, where they could come in, they could destroy uh, places, and um, be 50 miles away before anybody could do anything about it. So the in indications are that the uh, many of the for first forts in Europe were built by the invaders right over the ashes of the mother people whom they destroyed. 
um, and the position of women decayed greatly. Um, women um, and the equality between the sexes changed. It was the great turning point in European history, I think the wrong turning point, that turned the earth into real estate, that changed the relationship of people fundamentally to the earth, and which introduced a kind of warfare which had not existed before. And they're special, you can go to the museums in Romania and Bulgaria and see this. So I wanted to recreate a mother culture before this happened. I wanted to see what it was like. And so I took the research from the various parts of Europe and I put them together and I reimagined the rituals and I thought what it would be like to live in a culture, particularly as a woman, where you had never uh, endured um, the feeling of being second, where there was great equality, where women were treasured, where consuls of women could sit together and make decisions, where priestesses uh, were there, where the earth itself was a great mother that brought forth life and that everything in the earth, was the ch every, every living thing, was united as children of the great mother of the earth. And I have a passage which, which really describes this. Um, um, let's see here. Uh, I want to read the, where's that one? That's um, Village of Bones. Yeah, the, we're doing Village of Bones. Yeah, that's not Village of Bones. That's near the horses. Game. I'm going to move a little ahead here from what we were doing. Uh, and I want to read you a vision of the um, mother of the mother people. Mariah, the main character, is given a vision. And here is, um, here is her vision. Um, and she's, she's been given a vision by the goddess um, that um, you'll see later sends her across Europe to um, save her people. She becomes the savior of her people. And her mother and she have gone into it, taken a steam bath, and they've gone in, and they've, um, they've thought about this. And, and now Mariah's having a vision. And first she's a bird, and she's, she, her vision is flying and she sees uh, cities and villages. Um, and she flew higher. Beyond the cities, there were more cities and villages stretching east as far as the eye can see. There were rivers and forests and many people, all different, yet all worshiping the goddess Earth. Some raised goddess stones to her. Others carved her image in marble or jade stone. Still others took clay and formed it into her likeness. To some, she appeared as a sacred snake whose coils were the endless energy of life itself. To others, she was a holy bird who brought life and death, or the dog who guarded young life, or the womb-shaped frog in the north. She was often worshipped as a pregnant bear or doe, and to the south, she often appeared as a bull bearing the horns of the crescent moon. But no matter how she revealed herself to her people, her commandments were the same, and in every city and village and forest, her children sang of her love for them and their love for her. And as Mora hovered over this, a voice spoke to her, saying, go higher. And she went higher, and the air grew cold. And she saw beyond, beyond the lands of the goddess, another land covered in grass, where men in leather tents prayed to a god of war and killed each other in his name. Their god was a god of exile who lived in the sky, and the earth was a dead thing to them. And as Mora watched, the men mounted their horses and began to ride west, setting fire to the land, killing the animals, destroying the forest and fields, laying waste to the cities, and people fled in terror, and a great moaning rose in the east, and a dark cloud grew nearer all the time. And the voice said, look, the time of destruction is coming, and you, Mara, are my messenger. Go to Shara, the city of the east, and warn my children that the riders are on their way. Take your brother with you, and take the stranger to prove you speak the truth. Yes, Mara said, I'll go. And as she spoke, her wings failed, and she began to fall and fall and fall until everything was fallen. So that's a vision of this peaceful land um, where people are living in small communities, where they are agricultural, where they don't have war. Um, and you know, this I wanted to represent a world that we could all go back and live in, that we could feel what it was like to live there. And so in this book, we go all the way across Europe and we look at the great variety of cultures that exist at the time, all united by this feeling of the sacredness of the, of the mother. So that's the uh, plot arc, actually, for the whole trilogy. Yeah. yeah. That uh, actually begins with your latest book, which um, is the first book of the series, Village of Bones, Savala's Tale. Uh, so you've described the motherland uh, and this sense of prophecy that's come mm -hmm. and the danger that was faced mm -hmm. by them. Um, so let me ask you about the sexual relationships of Savala and her beloved Arash. 
Uh, this always, Mary likes to write sex scenes. We used to joke as <laughs> part of our ongoing jokes <laughs> with each other. Um, sacred erotics of your novels. Um, and you, uh, how did you come to um, think of them and describe them as sharing joy? I, I was trying to look at sexual relationships that were based on pleasure, not power. And I was very interested in what it would be like for people to, you know, enter with none of the kind of cultural baggage that we everyone has, uh, that um, where people met as equals and where pleasure was um, important and where people shared pleasure and shared it with generosity and love and compassion. I actually have a series of poems called the Kama Sutra of Kindness, where I talk about how, you know, in, in sex there's also kindness and love coming in. And so I, they, they talk about sharing joy, and they have some special rules in, in my world. Now, you understand I'm a novelist. This is partly fiction, and there's no written history from this period. So um, I have to make things up and fill in the gaps. And you, know, that, you can do that when you're a novelist. You can't do that when you're a scholar. You can't. Uh, so I thought, OK, what would be a really egalitarian world? So it goes like this. Only the women can permit sex. Okay, so um, you know, and only the women, if they if they want to have children, they can they give the man a tap and he can enter them. Otherwise, they don't. So they have like what we might call night in the 1950s turn a lot of making out without what what Westerners would call sex, you know, with intercourse. And so there's a a kind of um, of carefulness in in the way they treat one another, where everyone is respected and everyone has the feeling of it. And they call it sharing joy. And it's also a religious ritual, because it's the worship mm -hmm. of the goddess, because the goddess gave us joy for sex, and she gave us love. And she and all animals experience pleasure and love in, in uh, intercourse. And so this is, so they call it sh uh, sharing joy. They also call it worshiping the goddess, because each act of love and um, non-power-oriented sex is an act of worship. Um, I want to, oh, you have a poem there, a, a love poem from Arash. Yes. To Yes, and here, no, the, one of the, this is the, my newest book, and actually it's over there on the table. Um, and this is, uh, this is a prequel. This is Sabala, who is called The Village of Bones, Sabala's Tale. And Sabala's Marah's mother. And this is how Marah, uh, who her mother has to save from the, uh, what they call the beast man, because they don't see the difference between the horse and the man at first, so they call them beast men, um, has to save her. And uh, in this book, uh, Savala uh, has a lover named Arash, and he's a troubadour. And he goes from uh, place to place all over Europe once again, uh, singing and telling the tales of the goddess and singing hymns to the goddess. And this is a love poem, which is a hymn to the goddess and also a hymn to Savala, his lover. And this, by the way, also is going to appear in my new poetry collection. I do a lot of poems in my books, because I'm a poet as well as a novelist. So I often integrate the poetry into the uh, work itself. This is Arash's song. Let me bury my face in your hair, for it smells like wheat and roses. Let me bury my body in your flesh, for it smells like wild lilies in spring. Am I singing of the goddess Earth, or my love who sleeps here beside me? Of both, I sing of both, of the grace of her brown hills and the brown curves of your breasts, of your ankles and wrists and her saplings that tremble when the south winds blow. I'm singing of the vast seas of your journeys and the infinite ocean of her love. Thank you. And also just, um, I want to just give a sidebar here. Um, another influence on me was Susan Griffin's Woman in Nature. and. Um, Susan Griffin argues in that book that uh, nature is treated often like women in patriarchal society. And I thought, well, in this kind of society, nature would be treated like the goddess. And um, that would include the hills, everything being seen as um, full of the compassion and love of the goddess. And you introduced the mother book in this novel, yes. Village of the Bones. Yes. One of the main uh, one of the main plots in here is that pregnant with Mara, uh, who's not been born yet, her mother travels to uh, what we would recognize as Delphi. And I did a lot of research on the uh, ancient stories about Delphi um, when it was uh, before the. Uh, uh, there's a myth that Apollo killed the snake um, and and seized Delphi, and the snake goddess was worshipped greatly in this era. And so uh, uh, Savala goes to this place, which I call Orphe, and she, uh, which is Delphi. And she meets a uh, great seer who's called the Great Python. 
uh, who represents the snake goddess. And the great python gives her a book. And the book is called The Mother Book. And The Mother Book has all things in it, past, present, and future. It's the most sacred book ever written, ever conceived of. And it's Marat's duty to carry it to safety so the nomads will never get their hands on it, to save it for a time, which I think of as our time, when we're going to need this knowledge. And so a lot of this is about the preservation of sacred knowledge. And that's what the mother book is. The mother book is very, Marat, uh, Savile is forbidden to read this book. Uh, and you'll see if that works out. <laughs> so, and then the second book in the series? Is that was that was the the mother book was the second book of the prequel series. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The second book, uh, which I'm working on, so I don't talk much about what I'm working on, is going to be called the mother book, and it's going to be about the mother book. And all I'm willing to say about it is it will have a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, then let's go on now to the uh, what was the original trilogy, the year the horses came. Yeah. This one. And um, so I know that you always have a philosophical vision and a spiritual vision and a, a message that uh, each book contains. Mm -hmm. um, and this one has, a, you have an ethical worldview that usually is, is expressed in your writings. And what was the moral center of the world of the mother clans? Well, the moral center is the earth itself, as I said before. The moral center is the sacredness of the earth and the guardianship of the earth, and then the understanding that all living things are connected, and that they're that you know in the um, patriarchal system, men in particular uh, have dominion over the animals, dominion over the earth, and in this culture, uh, there's no dominion, there is community of, of things in the earth. But my real message, you know, I'm a novelist, so I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm, it's not a, a propaganda. Um, the real thing I wanted to do, actually for all of you, for me too, was to create, bring this world alive so you could spend time in it. So you could see what it would be like to be in this world, to live in it. Uh, I did live in it myself, and it was often a shock to come back to what we laughingly call reality here. You know, I would, I would be immersed in this uh, other culture for days, even years at a time, and then I would come back and it would be, oh. You know, I have to now I have to drive through rush hour. You know, so, <laughs> but one thing I did, one one spiritual practice I performed while doing this, was to try to walk on the earth and feel like it was the body of the mother. And it's a very interesting thing to do this because you start actually feeling differently about the earth and about the things in it. You see the shining that's behind all of them. You see the kind of radiant aura of the earth when you do this, and you you move with it and. You also walk on places where the earth has been despoiled and you feel the pain. And you walk on the places where it hasn't been and you feel the joy. And so really the message of this book is that here is a world. I have now made it exist. It may not have existed exactly like this, but this is a reasonable guess of how it may have existed. And now it actually exists. Because you know, if you make something exist, then people can see it, understand it, and be with it. And I aim this, you know, you're a very select group of people. You're people with a lot of knowledge about these things. But I wanted this to go out to everybody. I wanted it to go out to people who normally would not read about things like this. People who even had religious feelings that were completely opposite to this. I wanted to see them to see this world and to be able to be part of it. And so this has had a lot of uh, success worldwide. It's gone out to people who otherwise would never have read about things like this, and that really was one of my major aims. How many um, languages are you translated in? Twelve. Wow. Including? Including Finnish. <laughs> yeah, I had a bestseller in Finland. I could, they, they sent me the reviews, but I could, only could read my name. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese and Hebrew. Japanese, Hebrew, Finnish, uh, Let's see. Um, you know, uh, uh, I don't think Chinese. That, that no, it wasn't Chinese because Chinese. You know, we, we didn't have the copyright agreements with them at the time. Uh, Spanish, French, Italian. You know, like Russian. Uh, so you know, quite a few. And then all of these books are. Um, you know, about three years ago, they all came back in print on, on electronic books on Kindle. So they're now all of these books. In fact, all of my novels are now available as electronic books, and they're all available as audio books and so audible books. And so that gives people also other venues to come to them. Many of them are also available still as uh, in paperback copies. But this was a huge kind of renaissance. And so now the series, people like series, and I've been writing a series for a long time, people will now uh, 
get the whole series and do it. So I feel like I've, I've had a little effect, I hope, of, of changing people's attitudes toward the Earth. Because people write you that you have. People, people write me that they have. Yes, they do. I mean, they, people write me and say that this you know, changed their lives, that they, it's really amazing to get these letters. It's very humbling and it's very moving to get letters like this. So the book, The Year the Horses Came, starts off with a ritual coming of age mm -hmm. for Marah, and can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, uh, it starts out with Marah as a, uh, you know, she's just gotten her first period, so she's just, you know, uh, moved into the uh, coming of age time, and they have a ceremony where they uh, paint her like a, a goddess, they paint her with spirals, and they uh, put a fringe skirt on her, and her, and she has a ch what's called a child's necklace. It's a necklace of shells, and all children wear this necklace, and it puts them under the protection of the goddess. So all children are under the protection of the goddess as they wear this child necklace. And her, what she does is she is given. Uh, she's never been allowed to go out in the boat by herself before. She's um, living in Brittany at this point. The seafaring people, or uh, channel faring people. And so she goes out to sea in a small boat to an island where she's supposed to throw her necklace into the sea to the sea goddess. And she does that. But as she's going back, she sees a man on the beach. And all of the people in um, old Europe this time uh, have dark hair and dark skin. And this guy has this, she thinks he's dead because he has this very pale skin and gray hair. She thinks he's an old dead guy. You know, and when he opens his eyes, they're blue, and she thinks he's blind. And it turns out he's one of the nomads who has made his way there. And it's the first nomadic uh, person that she's ever seen as she comes. And so she not only comes as the age of a woman, she finds her destiny at the same time. And then she goes back and she's feasted and she's, you know, praised because there's nothing more important than uh, when children, male and female, come of age and come into adulthood. But at the same time, Mara has found the destiny that the goddess predicted for her, that she would save her people from the nomads. And then the two of them set out eventually because They do. Of... She sets out. And this is also, many of my stories are stories of conversion. So she sets out with Stavan uh, and um, as they cross uh, the great through the great mother cultures, and you know, he sees them. He's come from a much more violent culture, of the culture of the nomad. Um, he becomes converted, and becomes uh, converted to a man of the mother people. And so, uh, I often have, also in the village of Bones, I have the same thing. I have conversions because I think that you know this is the kind of inspiration that you know what's seen is um, can have great effect. And the song lines. Um, oh, yeah. Um, when they go out, they follow. Um, Mara's mother has a map made of songs, Savala. And in, in the village of Bones, when Savala travels to Brittany, you get some of her songs as she travels. And then when Mara travels the other direction, she follows her mother's songs, and her songs become a map. And so almost every chapter uh, of the village of Bones has, um, has a poem in it that is a song, which is also a song map. And I actually think probably the Iliad and the Odyssey were song maps. Uh, I think song maps are very ancient. Uh, we know that uh, play, things like Beowulf are songs that were chanted that were preserved history. And I'm sure there were also uh, other kinds of information that were turned into song. Besides, I loved writing the poems for each one. Uh, for example, uh, both between the blue sea and the sea of gray waves lie the caves of Nar, where the animals dance. They dance for our ancestors when the world is ice. They will dance for our children when our bones are dust. Walk softly, walk lightly. The earth is sleeping. Walk softly, walk lightly. She is pregnant with dreams. And this is a guide to the great caves of, of, of the Pyrenees. At Lascaux and the other caves. And we actually, there's a scene here where she goes into the caves and sees all the animals dancing around the inside of the caves. And this is her mother's guide to those caves. So. Well, I see that we're going to have to um, go quickly on to okay. Horses at the Gates and Fires of Spring. What happens there? Oh, okay. Horses at the Gates. I say, Mara meets the road. nomads in here and is taken into the steps and escapes. Um, <laughs> and you know, and I, that won't wreck it for you because since she goes through the other three novels, you know she lives. You know, be pretty, you know kill, to kill your main character at the end of the first novel is not a good thing. Um, in the Horses at the Gate, she is, uh, as I said before, initiated into the secrets of the Dark Mother. Uh, and becomes a great priestess with great prophetic powers. And uh, the nomads, in this book, the nomads haven't come yet, so the horses are just coming in. 
And this one, they besiege the cities and come in. They're at the gates. And this is in the fires of spring. Marat's daughter uh, and son form the second generation, and they're half nomad, half mother people. And it becomes what Maria Gimbout is called the great marble cake of Western culture, where you find both of them existing uh, simultaneously um, and uh, taken together. And so that's the, that's the major plot line as you look at the progression. And it takes place in a period of two generations. The actual complete uh, invasion of nomadic invasion took about 2,000 years. It took quite a while. OK, so now we have turned to your questions. Any questions that you have about this series? Um, maybe as a novelist, Got it? Yeah. I'm curious, like as a novelist, what how do you think imagination can change reality? I think that we, before we do things, we have to be able to imagine them. We have to be able to dream them. That we, we build our world out of our dreams. And I don't mind dreams by incoherent sleeping dreams. I mean our visions and what we see. And so I think what novels can do, they don't always do this, but what they can do is give us another way of looking at the world, another, another dream to look at, another way of thinking about reality. And I think they can profoundly change the way people see the world. You know, there's a wonderful um, series of, of letters from Flaubert about uh, the education of the sentiments. He, he wrote a book called Sentimental Education, and that's the education of the emotions. And how can the emotions be educated? And just think for a moment, if you had history with no fiction, no novels, nothing, you would, not, you would only have the exterior of people. You wouldn't have their interiors. You wouldn't have the passion of Tristan de Sol. You wouldn't have the, um, the story of Inanna's descent into hell. You would not have that interior emotional uh, space. And I think that what novels can do and fiction can do is, is school us in emotional maturity and compassion. I mean, all the arts. Yeah, all the arts. All the arts. All the arts. Absolutely. I will be speaking as a novelist, but definitely yeah. all the arts. I was just curious if you had a sense of what the song sounded like. Uh, you know, I wish I wish someone would set them to music. I don't really know. I imagine there was drumming, and there was there there you know there are some flutes and things depicted. So I'm sure there were flutes and there was drumming. I think of them as joyful and exuberant, melancholy and sad. You know, with all the whole range of human emotion, uh, almost like. You know, I, I can't, we don't have any, you know, medieval ballads are about as close as we come to ancient music. But I, I really don't know. But I'm sure they were varied. And I'm sure people, you know, these people were, they, they aren't us, but they have all the intelligence and the powers and the creativity. And I'm sure they had as much wider range of creativity as we do. Everything from classical music to hip hop, basically. Hi, um, my name is Elliot. Um, Hi, Elliot. I, I, uh, read a lot about um, the Hebrew goddess. I actually was a, a friend of someone named Raphael Patai, who lived in Forest Hills, where I grew up in New York City. Um, and I mean, his work shows that, uh, the, let's say, the patriarchal Hebrew culture was quite oppressive sexually. That it shows that they were totally opposed to any form of Homosexuality, gay, lesbian, opposed even even indications in the Bible that people were put to death for masturbation. I just wondered if there's any indication of whether or not the goddess religions were similarly oppressive, or whether they were. No, there's actually a fair amount of opposite evidence that the goddess cultures were not repressive, particularly. I think you know it's it's really not a very hard formula. If you treat women like property, you're not going to have a lot of fun. You know? <laughs> have egalitarian relationships where you have love and respect, you're gonna have a lot better time. You know? But but of course we can't we don't we can't we don't have a time machine. I wish we did, but we can't we can't go back and see for sure. But the kind of celebrations and the things they do seem much more uh, positively body oriented. Um, Mary, well I'm impressed with your work. Um, 
uh, I constantly have um, a sense of knowing that uh, I was a goddess before. I have never read anything related. I've just had that sense since I was a little girl. Um, but hearing you and the way you, you describe and how you actually enter into your world of imagination, do you believe or have you ever thought that maybe you were a goddess? And, you know, thanks to the life that you have lived, I mean, for us, we live a, you know, we call this our reality. Mm -hmm. Um, but you also live into a different reality when you when you enter into this imaginary world. So do you feel that you have lived as a goddess before, or maybe you know transition? You know, I, I don't I don't make any claims. Um, I know <laughs> really seriously. People have asked me if I channeled this. You know, I I know all I know is that there are that all of us have much more imagination and power and um, and you know <laughs> compassion and. Uh, and, you know, thoughts in our head that ever come out around us that we're usually conscious of. And I think becoming conscious of that, becoming conscious of, of that great richness you have, um, fills you with something that's very special. Um, and I, I'm very grateful for that. But I think, I think anyone could do this. I don't, you know, properly thinking about it, properly doing it, I think anyone could be there. So I don't feel special in that one. Um, I have a somewhat different opinion. <laughs> I think of all of us as goddesses and gods. Well, yeah, I do too. Well, actually, you know, I was about to say that if you think of the Earth as the great goddess and all of it is part of her, then of course we're all part. We're all we're all sacred. Of course we are, and we have sacred bodies and sacred minds and sacred hearts. Hi, I'm picking up on what you said about dreams and mm -hmm. incoherent sleeping dreams. Yeah, and I think that was just a clarification. I'm curious. Yeah, it was if your own dreams inform your work? Sometimes they do. Uh, sometimes I remember them. But mostly the problem is memory. Um, and I think that uh, the kind of liminal state where I'm between dreams and waking allow me to very consciously explore it. Like I can say, all right, right now I want to talk to Mara, and I want to have her tell me what she's going to do next. And so I can envision that, and I can see it, and then I can remember it. Whereas in a dream, I don't have as much choice. I've only had one lucid dream. I'm a professor, you know, and I was teaching physics. And I don't know anything about physics. In fact, I'm terrified of it. Okay. And the students were angry at me. And I said, what day of the week is it? And they said, Wednesday. And I said, I have a Tuesday, Thursday schedule. You're a dream. And they said, you caught us. And I woke up. That's my only, <laughs> that's my only lucid dream. It's not, you know, not a very good subject for a novel. <laughs> I have one more question. Anyone else? Mary, we haven't discussed this before, but I don't know if this is more commonplace that I had envisioned earlier. I find in the writing process that it is really the only place in my life that I feel is a homecoming. And because it's all, the, the, the content is so extensive, it's kind mm -hmm. of holding all of that together. Yeah. Do you have, I've heard what you have said, do you have anything else to speak to that? Or is it a Yeah, a I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. For me, it's my meditation, it's my centering, it's my spiritual practice. Yes. It's, you know, I don't write, I mean, I like getting published, sure. And I like, I really want people to read my stuff, certainly I do. But I would write, if I were in Antarctica and there were only penguins, I'd write for them. You know, I mean, I just... <laughs> Right, because that is the way I center myself. That is the way I get in touch with my, my inner self. That's the way I expand. That's the way I become more, more myself, more human, and more in the world, and more out of the world at the same time. And it is a homecoming. It's coming back to yourself. And to write with no goal is very important. Mm -hmm. It's important to be able to write with no goal, and I do that a lot. Claire, I have one question. How long can you stay in that state of that creative process? The creative process, that, well, spiritual creative the spirit process. creative process, the trance state. Mm -hmm. um, I can stay in it pretty much as long as I want, except ultimately I will fall asleep if I, if I stay in it. Too. Seriously, <laughs> after about oh, an, I think an hour, I would I would get so far down that I would just go to sleep and then I'd wake up. But because I've learned to do it in and out, in and out like that, you know, back and forth, I can sit for a whole day and go in for a little while, come out for a little while, go in for a little while, so it kind of accumulates mm -hmm. over time. So I can do it, I can do it in tiny bits. Um, but for a long bit, I'd say about 
after about an hour, you don't want to exhaust it, you just want to let it flow, you know. And then sometimes you start to go in the state and you realize that you should really go to the beach, that you shouldn't, you know, you don't want to force it. It's not a forced thing. No, I, you know, I've done a lot of research. Uh -huh. I'm an artist and I've done a lot of yeah. research on the creative process. Right. And what you're doing is something so perfect. And your energy level, when you're on, you're on. Yeah. And so I think you're the ideal example <laughs> of an artist because you have to have that energy to create and the passion. Mm -hmm. But yet, to get into the, your unconscious or that REM mm -hmm. period, yeah. has anyone, any uh, psychiatrist ever interviewed you on your creative process? No. Uh, no, but you're right also, about that too, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, also something you need, and you know, I taught creative writing for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. You need that, that inner, inner stroke. You need that creative process. But you need craft, you know, too. You need, you know, if you're really going to, if you're going to write something, not just for yourself, but for the world, mm -hmm. you need to read, you need to know how to craft, you need to work it. So you need the rational process at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's also a combination of the rational and the irrational. Mm -hmm. They have to be combined. Yeah, so you're, you, you're, you're made up of all of that. I mean, you're a yeah, businesswoman. Yeah, I mean, woman. I think that's what allows You're definitely me. a businesswoman because you're successful. <laughs> and then you can flip over to the other side. Yeah, yeah. I think it's marvelous. Yeah. I'm, I'm really turned on good. by yeah. hearing you. I mean, I'm ready to work. <laughs> good. Great. And, you know, have fun with it. If it's not fun, yeah. why do it? There's easier things to do passion. in the world than writing. total passion. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we can take it. one more question. Is there anyone else? Okay, well, we will segue into the poetry, but I did want to let you know about Mary's other books uh, out of the 14. There's some of them are sitting in here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can hold them up while you read them. Yeah, why don't you do I'll that? be your signboard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Visual aids. All right. Okay. Her very first book was called Immersion, and it's probably the first eco feminist book of the second wave of feminism. Written in the Jungle, which she has a, which is another home. Oh yeah, I, I home. lived in the jungles of Costa Rica off and on for six years, and then I spent time in the Amazon. And the last 25 years, my husband and I've been going to Brazil, and we've gone up the Amazon. So I'm, I'm very entranced with the jungle. It's very important in my poetry. Yeah. That's the Upper Amazon at sunset. Right? Mm -hmm. So that was uh, her first book, and then the second book. Um, she wrote three dramatic novels, uh, historical novels, and her um, next one was the New York Times best-selling book, which is A Grand Passion, about three generations of um, ballerinas beginning in, in Russia. She knows Russian herself, um, and I thought she knew ballet. <laughs> yeah, everybody thought I knew ballet. Everybody said to me, oh, how long did you dance? And I said, six weeks, I hated it. I sprained my ankle. <laughs> but I, I liked the form. It's a wonderful book. It's truly wonderful. Yeah, this was the New York Times bestseller. And um, the next one is really, I think, one of my very favorites, The Kindness of Strangers. It's a historical novel about the radical German theater during the rise of Hitler and into World War II, and um, with uh, a resistance movement. Mm -hmm. And it's a parable, I feel, for, with lessons for us today, with the um, rise of the right wing. And, yeah, it was, it's, uh, and it was very resistance. interesting to do the research on this, because as, as things have been developing lately, I've been seeing incredible numbers of unfortunate similarities. Mm -hmm. So that's very important, <laughs> especially now. And the next one was Season of Shadows, a novel about two friends from who were at, uh, graduate students at uh, Radcliffe and Harvard who were caught up in the civil rights movement of the 1960s and their stories and the politics. And as usual, a, a really nice romance in there or two. Um, and then she has three comic novels. As I said, she's a, a very funny person who happens to be rel related to Mark Twain. Uh, actually. <laughs> and so in it, her first one was McCarthy's List, which she describes as a comic novel set in the 1950s at the height of McCarthyism and written in the first person insane. That first and, person uh, insane, by the way, is that uh, she thinks she can see into everybody's mind, so she narrates it in the first person, but she knows what everybody's thinking, and that's third person. And I refer to it as uh, nonstop manic. Yeah. <laughs> and, a woman told me she was thrown out of a library for laughing too hard. <laughs> it really kept me laughing and chuckling a lot. So that was wonderful. And two more, The Stand-In and Sweet Revenge. Yeah, uh, two. Sweet Revenge with me. But yeah. yeah. 
And then she wrote two Civil War novels, the notorious Mrs. Winston and The Widow's War. So she turned her hand at that. One of them uh, was about a woman pretended to be a man. Right, a woman disguised as a man who fought in the Civil War. And it turns out there were over 350 women who fought in the Civil War disguised as men, which was denied for generations, even though some of those women got Civil War pensions. Mm. Federal pensions. So let's turn to your poetry. Um, she's an award-winning poet, uh, and uh, the uh, breaking the fever. She herself is rather feverish from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell them about Yeah, her um, one thing I think that has, has, has moved me toward <laughs> mystical and prophetic poetry is ever since I was six months old, I've run ridiculously high fevers, several times over 107. Oh, I have no. witnesses. Yeah, I mean, I supposedly I should be in convulsions and be, you know, have a, possibly part of my brain is missing, but I haven't noticed it. Um, and in these fevers, starting when I was a small child, I saw I saw like a veil of the world, and I saw things behind it. I saw things, you know. And I'm not sure whether these are prophecies or hallucinations, or you know, it's probably you know, a brain. I don't know what it is, but it was. It's been very interesting because it makes me see things that are more than reality, and it's made me very interested in in uh, looking just beyond, you know, looking like. If you look at your thumb long enough, it, it will change into a starfish. I mean, if you really look at reality or you really look at things, you see so much more than you would otherwise. And so um, these fevers have, and I, 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 my husband over there who's, who's sitting at the book table can, can bear witness to the fact that one time when I had a very high fever in a small Mexican town with no doctors and I had probably food poisoning, I spoke for how long was it? Did I speak in rhyme couplets? Well, two to four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Rapid rhyme couplets. Rapid rhyme couplets. And I cracked jokes, too. You thought I was dying? I'm cracking jokes. Wow. You know, if you haven't really had if they give you a choice for death, take high fevers because you feel, up to 105, you feel horrible, but over there, you just feel great. <laughs> Everybody else is running around saying, she's dying, she's dying. And you say, it doesn't matter. Hey, you know. <laughs> you know? So, so uh, yeah, so that's been, an, that, seriously, that and the jungle have been major influences on my poetry. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, do you want to read a poem or two from Break the Fever? Sure. From, uh, from Break the Fever? Yeah, let's see here. I have a little, a little list of poems that I was going to read. Find a, find a page there. Page five. Uh, yeah. Or... Oh yeah, for page five. Yes. So, so this is actually this is, this book is called Breaking the Fever, and it's exactly about that. It's about these fevers. This, by the way, is another picture of the Amazon taken by my husband. It's been digitized. Breaking the fever. When I was young, fevers were attacked. The grown-ups would rub you with alcohol, wrap you in wet sheets, refuse you blankets, fan you, feed you aspirin, plunge your wrists in cold water. They knew fever had to be fought because it let children see forbidden things. At 105, I would start to hear voices, soft and lulling. At 106, the faces would appear, swimming around me. Stretching out their hands, they would gesture to me to join them. I was always very happy then, floating out on the warm brink of the world. The fever children would sing in high voices, liquid like silver bells. Come with us, they would say. Come play, Mary and they would show me maple trees turning red and gold, long aisles of sunlight, and woods that glowed and trembled. My body would start to come apart very gently, like milkweed fluff, and I'd begin to rise up toward their hands. But always at the last moment, the dark circles of the grown-ups' faces would force me back down, and their fear would pin my chest to the mattress like black crystal paperweights. They would force more aspirin on me, more ice and alcohol rubs, more wet sheets. And if that didn't work, they would lift my naked body and plunge it into a tub of cold water, ignoring my screams. Come back, they'd plead. Come back, come back. And my fever would buckle and snap like the spine of a beautiful snake crushed under a boot. Then the fever children would abandon me, and I'd be left in a world of ordinary things, light bulbs, used Kleenex, hissing radiators thermometers. I would see my mother's pale, terrified face, and my stuffed animals, and my brother's crib, and my precious fever would lie broken in a thousand bits with no way to put it back together. And I could never explain how kind it had been, how foolish we were to fear it. And then, um, let's see, do you want me to read another poem? Or a witness? Yeah, I'll read a witness. 
sometimes I think that I'm writing, sometimes I think that I am writing not for us, but for the people that come after us. And this is such an important time that I wanted to leave a poem that was a witness of what the world was. And this is the old tradition of bearing witness, of saying what you believe is the truth. Um, it's a, both a religious concept and a concept of, of truth saying. And so this is called Witness. There were once beasts called elephants. When one could not get food, the others fed her. They were taken for their tusks, which were made into bracelets and piano keys. Their feet, which were made into footstools. The seals were made into hats and coats. The salmon were fished out of the rivers and eaten. The ostriches were taken for plumes for hats, and giraffes became seat covers. There were once trees, older than our oldest cities, with trunks as thick as the pillars of temples. Near the end, people tried to save them by sitting in the tops, but they were forced down, and the trees became plywood. Mostly it happened by accident. No one meant to get rid of the frogs. At night, they used to sing so loudly, we had to shout over the sound of them. And then one summer, they sang softly. And then one summer, they stopped singing. The honeybees died of some kind of virus. Then the crops failed, and the fruit trees stopped bearing, and a great silence spread over the field. Soon, only the old of, oldest of us could remember a time when we woke to the humming of the locusts, when a coyote danced in the sagebrush, a beaver felled a tree, a rhinoceros bathed in the mud, and wild roses bloomed in the ditches beside the roads. On summer evenings, large birds used to cross the thin golden plate of the sun. In the forest, the whippoorwills sang all night long. Uh, and then Sugar Zone. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the one you won the Penn Award for. I did, yes. And um, I'm going to read you a poem called uh, Solange. Solange is a recurrent character in here. She might be a prophet, she might be a priestess, she might be an ex lover, she might be me. I'm not telling, you know. <laughs> so, but she recurs <laughs> multiple times. And I'm going to read you a poem. Um, called, let's see if I can find it, uh, let's see here, since it's, oh, it's in here, it's not in Sugar Zone, um, so I was going to read Sugar Zone, <laughs> uh, here we go, I'll read the Jag, I'll, I'll read something else out of Sugar Zone, and then I'll read a Solange book. This is called The Jaguars That Prowl Our Dreams, and I, I played a lot, of, I, I, I learned Portuguese after a lot of time in Brazil, and so I mixed Portuguese and English in some of these poems, but they're written for English-only people. So if you, if you read only English, you understand them, and the Portuguese becomes a chant in the background. But if you speak a Romance language, Spanish, French, um, Portuguese, Romanian, any Latin, <laughs> nobody to talk to in Latin much, um, then you will get the extra parts of it. Um, the first words in here are the tributaries of the Amazon. The last words are tribes that were genocidally uh, eliminated by European conquest. The jaguars that prowl our dreams. Up on the Orinoco, Rio Negro, Solimoish, Tocantin, Xingu, Javare. They're drinking the bebida preta, black drink, snake, vine, ayahuasca, yage, blood of the great anaconda, with the smoke of burning rainforests in their nostrils, and who goes to Gisenesis, taste of ashes on their tongues. El se está comendo. They're eating purple snails, powdered viper venom. Largatas esmagadas, flowers that dye their lips the color of blood, singing of cities of blue glass and the jaguars that prowl our dreams. Who can mice? What else are they seeing? Who can mice? What else do they know? They're not saying, they're not telling. They're calling on the ghost tribes in Ted. instead. Ghosts of the Tupiimba, Tupanking, Amare, lost upriver, forever lost in the burning world. And um, let's see here. That's from that's from Sugar Zone. Um, and then, do you want me to read some from Travelers? Yeah, this Travelers from um, with no ticket home is. Well, this is how I imagine it. I want to <laughs> welcome Angus Wright, who is a, a professor from Sac Sacramento State and um, of environmental studies. 
and did re has done a lot of research on land reform in Brazil. So he and Mary have traveled to Brazil often. And I think you go out and research land reform and she writes poetry <laughs> while you're there. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So that's um, part of it. And there's pictures on the cover of all these books. This is a favela slum in Rio. It's been changed, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, this is um, where you bring the realities of Brazil to light and also where this book brings home for me the real complexity of Mary as a personality because I get one thing from reading her novels, which are complex and textured and that deal with war and um, the destruction of the goddess cultures, but her poetry just always comes, um, startles me because there is this we we're trying to figure out the right word for it. She calls it her prophetic. Um, it's it, it is has a, a it's different. It's it's a, a side that is it's not it's not the it's not the joking side. It's, it's not the, the joking side, side at all. It's the other side of her, a shadow side and terrible and tragic. So <laughs> that's how I experience it. <laughs> so that comes and it comes out of the blue because here's Mary, here's a poem, and all of a sudden, you know, there's the anaconda that strikes you dead. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, oh no, okay, I'm now what's snakes, this poem snakes about? <laughs> but would you read a couple of these poems for us, please? Okay, um, let's see here. Um, well, I'm mean, this is this is doesn't quite fit your um, what you just said, but this is called Solange. I was going to read that before. Solange is this multiple character who keeps reappearing in here. And there's a big dam that's been built um, on the um, Oronoco. And it's, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember. Shingu. What it's. Shingu? Okay, thank you, see? That's why I keep, him, I keep him around, not only for his wonderful companionship and kindness, but because he remembers things. <laughs> So let's see here. Oh yeah, on the Shingu. It's uh, it's the Belomonchi Dam on the Shingu, and it's destroying just you know, also, it's an ecological disaster, and it's destroying uh, indigenous lands and everything. And so Solange at this point becomes a avenging fury here, and this is called Solange and Cruise a River to Destroy a Dam. And I want to uh, uh, just explain a few words here. Jagunsu means hitman. Uh, and there are 25 different words for hitman in Brazilian Portuguese, uh, which gives you an idea of uh, what goes on there. A jacaraca is a very poisonous snake, and um, boca de cob cobra is the mouth of a snake. And the Xingu is a great river that's a tributary of the Amazon. Solange encourages a river to destroy a dam. Xingu, Xingu, who is that dancer whirling and blind? Xingu, what god rides her head? Shingu, you're a jagunsu, a jacaraca, a santa mulher, a holy woman who smokes a cigar. You're the boca da cobra, the mouth of the snake, the soft pink part we see just before it strikes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, a, that's an anti dam poem. Um, yeah, some of them are dark, many of them are dark, actually. Uh, find you a decent dark one here. Oh, okay, this is good. I, uh, as an undergraduate, I worked in the Harvard Ethnobotanical Museum as the gopher and, and uh, for uh, an assistant for Richard Evan Schultes, who's one of the founders of um, uh, ethnobotany and who was the first person to bring uh, ayahuasca to European attention, Western attention. And um, I haven't taken these things because if I had, I would probably be incoherent. Mm -hmm. But I, I I had, you know, boxes of ayahuasca that I had to categorize. I had, you know, all sorts of hallucinogens that I had to look up and look up what they were about and categorize. So I'm interested in their effects, and I, I've read a lot about them. And then Professor Schultes, who was a very straight-looking man and a, you know, Harvard professor in a suit and everything, there was a picture of him on the wall in a loincloth with a penis gourd and with guys blowing hallucinogenic snuff up his nose. So I thought this was an interesting combination. Um, <laughs> that was his research. You know? um, so <laughs> this is called Shakarunya Thras Luz. Shakarunya brings light. Shakarunya is one of the components of uh, ayahuasca, which is a, when properly done as a mixture. Um, and it's I'm I'm a very also interested in the dangers of these things and how in trying to storm the gates of enlightenment, you can damage yourself very badly. And so this is a poem about that. Shakarunya tras luz, shakarunya brings light. 
I still have that photo of you standing on the bank of the Jura, naked, your hair tangled, your lips parted in surprise, or perhaps terror. On either side of you, wearing only penis gourds, two kashiina, or maybe tanuka, are blowing hallucinogenic snuff up your nostrils, either through hollow puma bones, or the leg bones of some small bird now extinct, whose feathers you have woven into the wreath that you wear as a crown. On the back of the photo, you wrote, Shakarunya thras loose, Shakarunya brings light. Harupa, Punga, Marillo, Kaparunya, Leumu, Branca, Chakuka, Kama, Kama, Kamu. The head spirits are starting to speak. My body is dissolving. And then, in an almost indecipherable scrawl, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> uh, I have a special request. All right. One of my favorite um, eco-feminist poems that you wrote about a sea goddess oh. from Sepharia. And this, oh. these, those, many of these poems, and also this one is going to be in her newest book that's coming out this fall from that poem you just wrote, Jaguars That Prowl Our Dreams, the new and selected yeah. poems. In fact, every poem I've read to you will be in my new book, The Jaguars That Prowl Our Dreams. And if you're interested in finding out when it comes out, uh, if you go to my website, I have a newsletter. It only comes out four times a year. You will not spam your spam box. And you can just you know sign up, and you'll, you'll know when the, when the book comes out. And it's my good news newsletter. I decided we'd had enough bad news. Mm -hmm from everywhere, so it's a letter that I promise you will bring you good news. So I, I felt somebody needed to do that. This is Cytheria. Uh, you pronounce it, you know Greek, so you pronounce it. You better poet. pronounce You're it, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is about Cytheria, which is one of the names of uh, Aphrodite. Quivering fins ridged like rakes, a sliding gill-chambered tongue. The inside of her mouth is yellow and blue, Barracuda silver, sweet as red mullet, striped with black and green, with peacock flounder teeth, pink, sharp, and quick. So is angry, we've poisoned her oceans. At night, she climbs the waves, straddles the white foam, and calls to her whales. Are you cat food yet? She howls. Have they made you into soup and lipstick? She is unforgiving and methodical. When a dolphin gets tangled in a tuna net, she grieves. When a single cell of green algae dies, she knows it. This is quite a long poem, so I'm going to read you the sort of highlights. She who was so peaceful that the Phoenician sailors wrote oaths to her patience, calling her dove soft, smoother than their wives, purple-skinned and lovely as the harbor of Tyre, when the shellfish blossom. Oh, lovely sea goddess, they wrote. We move across your belly like bridegrooms, singing your praises. Now she sits in a dark cave, consorting with mores, sipping poison drinks. Cytheria is planning something down there. Some things he only tells to the spiny batfish and sea dragons. Perhaps she's decided to melt her ice caps, rise, and take back all the cities that ever emptied sewage down her throat. Perhaps she's decided to show us mercy we don't deserve, but don't count on it. Cytheria, the flowers we throw to you come back oil-soaked and dying. We stand on your beaches calling you up, but you no longer appear at our feet. You scatter pieces of styrofo styrofoam cups, tin cans, beer bottles, hunks of insulation, stinking fish and dead birds, and sometimes a jellyfish pulsing and dying like a punctured soap bubble, like a human heart gone bad. And you know, I wrote that in 1987. The ice caps hadn't really even been acknowledged to be melting much at that point. And then you have a funny poem. And then, uh, you know, yeah, and then we'll end with that. Yeah, that, yeah, that, here. that. That's one of her tra terrible and tragic poems. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the tragedy of the earth being destroyed really gets to me. Because um, I think it does all of us. Okay, I want to find, where is where's El Tells All? You know? Oh, I know, it's right, it's right at the beginning of this. I can find it. There we go. So this is the last poem I'm going to read you. And one of her more autobiographical. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Society for the Pre Prevention of Cruelty to Animals will get after me. This is called L Tells All. And, you know, I'm just going to do a little you know, footnote. You know, it's late in this one. It's, that's, she's, and this is her side of the story. You know, Yates' famous poem about late in the swan and the raven. This is latest story. L Tells All. I wanted a man, but they were in short supply. So when this big white swan followed me home and announced, I am Zeus, lord of all creation, I crooked my finger at him and said, come here, bird boy, let's give it a try. <laughs> at first, I have to admit it was fun, 
his soft breast, the excited squawk, the way he beat his wings frantically like an umpire gone bad, but basically it was an act of desperation. We had nothing in common. His feathers made me sneeze. I was afraid to fly. He was married. Of course, they all are. <laughs> we even had religious differences. What can I say? And then when there was other women, Io, Europa, Semele, not to mention the sluttish little pens he picked up in the park, we started to have terrible fights. I called him overstuffed, threw a pillow in his face. He threatened to migrate, the usual stuff. <laughs> By spring, we both had enough. One night, while we were sitting in a Greek restaurant, I told the old cob I'd always be his friend, but I just couldn't handle interspecies love. I lied. Of course, the uh, truth was I had already started to see a duck on the side. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mary. <laughs> Questions or comments on the poetry? Sure. Yeah. So, wait a minute. I'm bringing you the microphone. Thank you. So, I've always had reasonable skill as a writer, except with poetry. Um, when I write poetry, it's really awkward and terrible and feels unsophisticated to me. And nonetheless, a couple of times in my life, I've written poetry um, to write down a vision that I had and had it be um, sort of move through my life in really significant ways. And um, the fact that I don't feel good at it feels significant to me. It's something I'd like to work on. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have any tips for somebody who feels like they're horrible at writing poetry. Um, first of all, I mean, I know this is totally useless, but don't worry about it. Of course, that's useless. You, not, no use telling people not to worry. But um, one thing you can do is think of the poems you're writing as very rough drafts. And think of them as charcoal sketches. And now you need to fill in the color. So everywhere you have an abstract word, think of three or four words that are concrete. Like so, and think of a different word. So if you have walk, think of run, skip, hop, jump, crawl, slither, you know, and try a whole series of words and try putting different words in and making it very specific and concrete. Because generalities and abstract words can be trite, but specific instances are never replicated, so they can't be tried. And try that, and then try doing something, try cutting it so you only have the very best lines. I sometimes write poems that are like four pages long and they end up being like that. I cut every, ruthlessly cut everything that's not working. Mm -hmm. And I play with it until I get some rhythms and words. And it takes all, you know, I don't write my poems just off the top of my head. I spend a lot of time crafting them. And it pays off. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Well, I'm just curious, what's your writing schedule like? Maybe? What's my writing schedule? My writing schedule on days, well, like when I was teaching, I taught all day when I was teaching, but then it's usually in the mornings from when I get up to about 2 o'clock. And I just do that habitually, and I've done it for years and years and years. And you know, a page a day is a novel a year. <laughs> <laughs> what what did, did you tell, or do you tell yourself, when you do get a rejection? What? what do I tell myself? I'm going to repeat this because you can have the mic. Um, what do I tell myself when I get a rejection? I try not to read rejections. I've asked my agent not to send them to me because I have two reactions. One is, I'm no good, there's no use ever going on. I might as well just give up now and crawl into a closet. And the other one is, I will get this person if I have to hunt yeah. them to the end of the day. Neither of these things are useful, <laughs> so I just, just try to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> what was that you did to a review of one of your books? Oh, that was a, um, for the year the horses came. I was attacked in the Chicago Tribune for um, for the, for uh, driving white men to vote Republican. Okay, and so the, and he, the person who did it had not read the book. He'd only read the flap, but he thought all the men in the book were, were going to be negative. He had this you know this stereotypic image of what a feminist is, what a person is, who, what a woman writer is. And you know the men's in my there, there are what great variety of men is there a great variety of women in my books. There's you know virtue is not gender uh, applied. And so um, I thought you know and I, I thought well you know I'm not going to what he expects me to do is rave back at him. So I didn't do that. I I, I started the reply which the Tribune printed with. Uh, when I was 13, I used to stand in front of the mirror and say, 
born to drive men wild. Little did I think I was born to drive men to vote Republican. <laughs> so that I just and I just took that kind of humorous, mocking, satirical tone. It worked beautiful. <laughs> so that's another response to the rejection. <laughs> Something else? When you're writing your poetry, I, don't, I mean, possibly when you first started many years ago, yeah. did you feel a need to share and, and be critiqued, or did you make the final decision when it was done and good? I, yeah, I, I don't, um, I, I'm allow, I allow an editor to critique my poetry. My poetry's all been edited. Uh, all these books are edited, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to do my poetry in a group. My novels, I do. I've always formed po a, a novel writing group, sometimes with men, sometimes with women, you know, um, and we share our work. And I take critique on that. But with my poetry, I, I figure it out. I do it, and then when I have it polished and put together, then I'll let editors give me feedback. But I don't, I don't want to share it before it's done because if I share my work too early, it freezes in my mind, mm -hmm. and I can no longer see how to fix it. It becomes something that's there instead of something that's fluid and in process. It's, it hardens, and so I don't I don't tend to share it till it's really. Uh, but not the novel, just. But not the novels. No, and, and novels are so much more a complex puzzle that I I need all the help I can get from, and I only share it by the way with other writers more or less at the same level I am because that that works best and and that is very helpful to get feedback, but I don't let anybody that I. Um, intimately involved with relatives or anybody see it. Uh, Angus doesn't see my work until it's published, even though his, my, most of my books are dedicated to him, because there's too much emotional involvement with people um, um, that you're very close to, like relatives and, and spouses and things to do that. So isolation is essential? For the poetry, yes, but not for the novels. So it's like two, two aspects. Okay. And by the way, I write all my poetry out longhand, and I write all my novels on a computer. Sure. I have another special request, but we have to stop. <laughs> um, you, when we were co-teaching on the mm -hmm. Women's Visionary uh, Poetry, a number of the students really liked your Kama Sutra poems oh, yeah. because they, I think one student had said they rarely heard a love poem that was about a long-term relationship. So could you read Yeah, the Kama Sutra of Kindness, position number three. And there, and I, there are now six positions here. Um, and these are the, oh, I'll just read it. It's, it speaks for itself. It's easy to love through a cold spring. When the poles of the willows turn green, pollen falls like a yellow curtain, and the scent of paper whites clots the air. But to love for a lifetime takes talent. You have to mix yourself with the strange beauty of someone else. Wake each morning for 72,000 mornings in a row, so breathed and bound and tangled that you can hardly sort out your arms and legs. You have to find forgiveness in everything, even ink stains and broken cups. You have to be willing to move through life together the way the long grasses move in a field when you careen blindly toward the other side. There's never going to be anything straight or predictable about your path, except the flattening and the springing back. You just go on walking for years, hand in hand, waist deep in the weeds, bent slightly forward like two question marks. And all the while, it burns, my dear. It burns beautifully above you and goes on burning like a relentless sun. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you so much for your generosity and your I call Mary a genius. I think we need to do more of this for more women, and Mary's on my genius list. <laughs> so, and you're a brilliant writer, and thank you so much thank for you. sharing with us this evening. And Mary's books are available. They're especially discounted for tonight, also as a benefit to the program. And I have one last announcement to make. Oh, in addition, as you said already, they're available um, on Amazon and as Audibles. Uh, he works at Audibles, yeah. Our Women's Spirituality program is going to continue its Women's Spirituality programming by a special conference this fall called Women's Spirit Rising, uh, Envisioning Post-Patriarchal World. So you have the pre-patriarchal worlds. So we're going to do the <laughs> post-patriarchal worlds. And you're all invited to come next October 12th to 14th and send in proposals if you want to present or do a workshop or roundtable. 
and uh, please see us again in the, in the fall. And we have flyers out there about it. So thank you all for coming. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd be happy if you if you'd like to get a book, I'll be happy to sign it.